Are you guys here already? Is this the part where I tell you this amazing story about Oatly? Wow. Well, I wasn't expecting you this early, but since you're here, we might as well start. Um, let's just start with a formal introduction. It's me, uh, I'm John, sometimes I wear this cow hat. Um, not very often, but occasionally. And about, let's go back to like 2012, so nine years ago. I have this friend and his name's Tony Peterson. And Tony gave me a call out of the blue and said, John, what's up? I said, not a lot, Tony, what's up with you? And he's like, uh, I just got this job as the CEO of an oat milk company. I'm like, oat milk company? That sounds extremely um, uninteresting. And so he showed me the packaging and I thought, not only does it sound uninteresting, it really looks uninteresting. If you look at the packaging here, you can see that it pours from the right as it should. We joked at the time and said, looks like a Dutch multinational. Not that there's anything wrong with Dutch multinationals. It's just that a lot of multinationals happen to be Dutch. Um, and so he said, John, can we do something with this? And I said, um, sorry, Tony, I, I don't really know if I want to get involved with this. I'm really happy for you, great career move and everything, but um, goat milk, oat milk, I, I, I don't know. And Tony was quite persistent and he gave me a call again and said, John, come on, seriously, let's do something with this. And Tony and I have been friends for about 25 years. And so I realized that if my friend was the CEO, that was a um, opportunity for me to prove everything that I believed in and that I would have no excuses for any type of failure other than my own. So I said, okay, I'll do it, Tony, if we can kill the marketing department. Um, because my feeling was I wanted to give some payback to all those marketing directors out there who were too scared to buy the ideas you know, I figured they ruined my best work. And you can put the quotes around work if you want because you don't think I necessarily work. But, um, and I thought like, wait a second, I'm always complaining that they're too scared or, or whatever, what, what? here's my opportunity. Tony of course said, sure. I mean, what could possibly go wrong if you put a bunch of creatives in the center of a food company? It's nine years later, and I thought we could take a look at what actually happened. I thought we'd start with KPIs, because we don't really use KPIs. Um, but I thought it might be interesting if we did to show you what kind of KPIs, because we kind of use KPIs. So here's our KPIs for 2021. Um, let's run a Super Bowl spot. I mean, we're big enough now. Um, we want to reach a mainstream American audience. What are we going to put on there? Well, I know. We shot a commercial back in 2014 with Tony, where we made Tony sing a song that he wrote himself in the middle of an oat field. I mean, what are friends for? Let's, let's, let's put Tony in front of 100 million Americans and let them judge his, his singing ability. Um, and so we did. It's like milk made for humans. It's like milk that made for humans. Wow, wow, no cow. No, 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 wow, wow, no cow. No, 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 wow, wow. When it comes to putting him in front of a hundred million Americans, it was a bit of a failure because this year only 96.4 million Americans got to watch Tony sing live on the Super Bowl. Um, I don't think he'll ever be able to land at Newark again without everyone recognizing him, but I, I don't know if Tony fully understands that yet. The other KPI with it was that, okay, if we're going to do a commercial, why don't we have the commercial be called the worst commercial in Super Bowl history? And so 
it didn't take very long after the Super Bowl actually, commercial actually ran. It was like two o'clock in the morning or something, European time. And Twitter lit up and Instagram lit up with this. The worst Super Bowl commercial I've ever seen. And in the morning, the press was all over it. Here are the five worst Super Bowl commercials. Oakley's awkward jingle. And this was dubbed one of the worst, but we can't stop talking about it. The other KPI we had at the same time we wanted to make the worst commercial in Super Bowl history was we wanted to make the best commercial in Super Bowl history. And I think that it took about 10 minutes after it ran and BuzzFeed was already calling this either the worst or the best Super Bowl ad of all time. And people were writing all kinds of things like, I'm not even watching the Super Bowl and my feed is only about the Oatly commercial. And, you know, it's like, you know, uh, be right back and buy some stocks. Well, there, there, <laughs> there were no uh, Oatly stocks available, of course, at Super Bowl time. So, um, and we knew we were in a pretty good situation when Questlove actually came on and said, you know, Oatly won because Questlove is actually Questlove. And here's another one, how Oatly outsmarted the Super Bowl by being as annoying as possible. The other thing we thought was, best Super Bowl spot, worst Super Bowl, how about the weirdest Super Bowl commercial in Super Bowl history? And we got that headline also, you know? This was just, you know, this was so weird, it was a genius troll. Uh, the other thing I have, this was a personal KPI. I figured if we're going to put Tony on the Super Bowl, I would like to make him even more uncomfortable. I would like that Super Bowl ad to generate enough interest so that I can get Tony on the Jimmy Kimmel show. And it didn't take more than a couple of days. And here's Jimmy Kimmel. The CEO of Oatly sang a song he wrote about oat milk. This guy paid five and a half million dollars just to let us all know he's not a good singer. Total mission accomplished. Uh, the other thing is, is that I mean, the New York Times has the most impact of any publication that I know. And so, because the lyrics of Tony's amazing song, Wow, Wow, No Cow, it's like milk, but made for humans. No, 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 no cow, something like that. Um, because that's actually what we wanted to get people thinking and singing in their head. My whole thing was like, I mean, the ultimate dream would be, to get the New York Times to print the lyrics of this song. And so the next morning, here's the breakdown on the New York Times, 10 things you might have missed at the Super Bowl, the Oatly commercial, it's like milk but made for humans, it's like milk but made for humans, wow, wow, no cow, no, 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 wow, wow, no cow, no, no, no. Oh, I mean, wow. Well, let's go on. Um, I also figured because everyone loves to hate Fox News, or at least I personally love to hate Fox News, I would love it if they picked up the story, but totally fucked up the facts. And so next morning, here's the Fox News story. Oatly Super Bowl commercial shirt for haters goes out of stock in less than 24 hours. All they needed to do is give us a call and we would have told them that we sold out of this t-shirt. Now, this t-shirt is um, because we kind of knew that people wouldn't like Tony singing potentially, we printed up 500 t-shirts called and it said, I totally hated the Oatly commercial. And we gave away them free. And if you were in Tampa where the Super Bowl was, or you were in New York City or LA, we had bike messengers running them out to people before the game actually ended. And people were of course blown away. And we sold out of these shirts in three minutes. Sorry, Fox News. Um, the other thing that I thought would be good is like, when you're working with something like the Super Bowl, you're thinking like, okay, how do I become a part of cultural history? And there's no better way than becoming a part of cultural history than finding a way to turn Tony into a Muppet. It's like milk, <laughs> made for humans. It's like milk. But made for humans. Wow, wow, no cow. No, no, no. Wow, wow, no cow. No, no, no. It's
It's alright It's like milk Oh, it's alright, yeah It's just like milk Wow, wow No cow No, no, no Wow, wow No cow No, no, no Fantastic. So how are we doing on this year's KPIs according to the Oatly Department of Mind Control? Total success. So I thought we could take a step back a little bit. And now that we've just, you know, established some sort of KPI success for, for 2021. So I thought we could take a step back again and look exactly. So what, what is the role of the creative department, the Oatly Department of Mind Control? And most of the time you'd say like, yeah, you guys do some branding stuff and so we sell all the products we make, right? Um, maybe that's it. But we look at it more like what we do is to make Oatly impossible to copy. Um, and when you remove the um, marketing department entirely from a company, um, there's a number of advantages that you get from this. The first one is, is that you no longer have any need to run a brief system at all. And you're like, well, what do you mean? Well, it's like all your creatives are up to speed all the time on what's going on. I mean, a brief usually is like working on some lasagna, working on some snow tires. And um, the oat milk people come and they wanna talk oat milk. So you gotta put your creatives, get their mind, you know, um, ready for that meeting. And so you get a brief and it goes back and forth on what the company wants. We don't, we don't need a brief because everyone's up to speed. And what this means is that the creatives are actually interacting with everyone else in the company and it builds this culture. And this is maybe the most important thing with Oatly is that it builds a culture of collaboration and trust. Everyone working together to, uh, to solve a problem. Um, the second thing is, is that we, the creatives, are allowed to focus 100% on the details. And that allows us to at least strive every single time, even if it's the shelf wobbler, um, to be world-class. Um, and, and not spend any of our time discussing, for example, what the CEO might think. This is how most companies actually work. You got a commercial department and a marketing department. You got a commercial director and a marketing director. Usually they're very competitive, the two of them. Um, and so they may talk, but they're usually not working together, collaborating like they should. And so the, the, the commercial director talks to the marketing director and the marketing director goes, okay, ad agency, PR agency, media agency, event agency, social media agency, and it's just back and forth, this incredible epic, you know, ebb and flow of briefs and whatever. Uh, it looks like this, you know, brand awareness studies, target group analysis, midway meetings, idea presentation, feedback, second round of presentation, tweak, pre-testing, planning, testing, test results, and it just continues to go on. We don't do any of this. Absolutely none of it. Um, nothing on this screen is anything that we do. This is our system. Everyone's always focused on how we can make Oatly better. What are the opportunities? What, what are the problems? What are the challenges? What are our weaknesses? And we speak in a group and we start to develop ideas. And when we have a good idea, we just, you know, Oatly Department of Mind Control starts to execute it. So in essence, we brief ourselves, we do the work, and then we approve our own work. Think about that. From a creative point of view, this is like perfect. However, you can say like, wait a second, you know, what do you mean you guys approve your own work? Well, the only person technically that has a say above the creative department on anything is Tony, because you know, Tony is boss man, the CEO. And um, he can, but the thing is, is that 
Tony's more challenging than anything else. Tony pushes us to be better. Tony sees things from a different perspective. And so he's actually an asset to us. He's like a team player, one of the team players making us actually better. It also is very important to realize that while we do have final say in every piece of creative, we can't be successful at all without uh, talking to sales, <laughs> talking to innovation, talking to product development, talking to supply and production. We need to be involved in all these people to, with, with all these different people in all these different apartments to actually under, understand what's going on. The third point is, is that we no longer have to make things for internal presentations. <laughs> we can make stuff for real people, like, and not for spreadsheets or investor decks or you know any other reason. We can just actually spend all our time making things that people actually like. The fourth thing is that um, we're allowed to have opinions about things. We had an opinions about what was wrong with the food industry and we had opinions about what was wrong with business in general and, and capitalism or whatever it may be. And so we thought, why should we hold those back? Why shouldn't we share those and make those a part of what we were actually doing? And so we did. And we put a lot of these um, opinions directly onto our packaging as a way to let people know what we stand for. Now, a lot of companies will say like, wait a second, you're putting some bold stuff on your packaging. That's a way to like, not everyone's gonna be happy with that. We don't really care to tell you the truth. We, we don't really mind if people don't like us. They can buy something else. They don't have to buy our product, but it's also an incredible way to meet a lot of new friends. And if you look at this packaging, here's what we believe. I mean, it basically states, this is from 2014, exactly what we believe. Everyone should be treated equally. Um, the reckless pursuit of profits by company should be per perceived as criminal. Um, and these are the things that I think make us very different. This makes us human. It makes us human and not a logo. One of the things that we try to focus on all the time at Oatly is that every single person is not representing a company. They're representing themselves. They're just a person trying to help other people make a few changes in their lives. And that extends definitely into our, into our voice. And this builds you know, massive, massive trust with consumers. Voice, we just said the word voice. And I can tell you that we look at ourselves more as a voice than as a brand. I mean, everyone knows what a brand is. You go to business school, you learn what a brand is, brand, brand, brand. But we think of ourselves as a voice. And when we say we're a voice, it means like every place that we go, we can be ourselves. Think about it. Oatly's gonna go to Holland, all right? All right, into the Netherlands. Most companies would say like, what do the Dutch people like? Well, how do we need to be like them? We never did that. We just like, here we are, let's go into Holland and just let them see who we are. And if they like us, cool. If they don't like us, all right, doesn't matter. So instead of being a schizophrenic, like brands are, trying to fit, you know, trying to change who they are to fit who they think they want to talk to, we just like roll in and say, hey, you guys want to talk? Let's talk. And so we put a lot of things in outdoor media where people aren't allowed to hide, where they're oftentimes in a rush to get from point A to B, and a little wall that's painted takes, I don't know, two, three, four days. Give them something to think about. It's like, you know, go ahead, pretend not to notice. We know you're reading anyway, because, I mean, the first time you run into Oatly, you don't need to know all our USPs. You just need to know, like, oat milk is something. Um, and so we, we spent, I, I know that a lot of you have seen um, Netherlands have been our like favorite country for outdoor. So a lot of you have seen a lot of these things, but it's just like we want to be in a public environment and we want to be, you know, having a dialogue with with uh, uh, with people. So uh, a couple from a couple from New York. This is the best copy of all and it's written by Lars, the art director. <laughs> And this one, I mean, this is the type of um, communication that marketing departments would just kill immediately. You've already said that. Can't you use the other posters to say something else? The next thing is, is that we have a way of working where we turn all our failures. We welcome failures. When I get feedback, consumer feedback, I only want to see the, the haters. Um, and so 
we like we have a system where we can actually turn our failures in, into into our advantage. I'll give you an example of this. Um, a few years back, there was a uh, the big dairy, the the company that sued us. They did their own campaign, and they did this campaign, and they were making fun of all plant based milks. But it was obvious that they were making fun of us, and they gave plant based milks these weird names that sounded like milk, but they were fake. So it was like puke and brilk. And they did these little commercials and it was like, only milk tastes like milk. So what well, we said, wow, that's interesting. They're becoming a little bit aggressive. What, what can we do? So we realized like, hmm, I wonder if they registered these fake names. Well, of course, they were so busy like trying to bash us that they didn't spend any time actually registering the names. So we registered the names. And then we put the names right on our packaging. Took away Oatly, just called ourselves Pjolk and Brilk. And um, used, you know, every time they ran their commercials, they ended up actually running their commercials for us. And this is like, this is the way that we work. It's central to everything. It's just like, what's going on? What can we do? Oh, they're making that statement? Great, let's use that as a new brief. The sixth point is that we can focus on inspiring people to make changes in their lives and hoping that these changes in their lives, positive change, what they eat, uh, what they consume, um, considering you know what's good for their body and at the same time what's good for the planet, we can focus on, on driving societal change and let that be a way to actually sell the products or vice versa actually, sell the products by finding ways to create um, positive change. Number seven here is that do stuff that companies, no, normal companies would never do. I'll give, I'll give you an example. So a, a few years ago, there was like, we had like a creme fraiche product and we thought like, wow, there's a lot of white cardboard on the inside, maybe we should stick something there. And so we did. Um, I figured like, I don't know, I have this bike, uh, some barbells, you know, a donut machine, some ice skates, and 342 issues of National Geographic from the 1990s that I thought would I didn't need to throw into the recycling bin. And so if anyone wants them, just let me know. And Tony said at the time, John, you can you can ruin your own life, but don't ruin, you know consumer responses live by a bunch of this stuff. So I had to answer all these emails myself, which which I did. And um, we actually spent time sending out um, National Geographic, 342 issues of National Geographic to whoever asked for one. This particular one went to Lithuania um, and we don't even have distribution in Lithuania. So I can't get any like return on investment on something like this because there is no return. I didn't even have a budget for this. I just took a stack of magazines into the office and one of our project managers helped me send them out. And I was just thinking like, imagine the April 1994 issue of the Everglades and you're in Lithuania and you get this, you will never forget that oatmeal company and therefore you'll talk about us forever. Um, another thing that we do, and I think this is one of the things that we're most proud of is that um, we found a way to put, we thought like, how are people going to make responsible decisions about the planet if they don't actually know what they consume and the impact it has on the planet? So um, we thought, why don't we put our climate footprint right on the front of the packaging? Now this sounds really simple, but each product needs to go through an independent uh, researcher and an independent company that will that will actually be able to give us that number. And each product has a different impact number. So this is something that marketing departments will say, great idea, but I don't think so. You know, we got a lot of paper printed already. We got this up and running from idea to product on shelf within three months. And we used it to challenge the food industry. Hey, food industry, show us your numbers. The thinking behind this is, you know the nutritional panels on the on the side of food products? It, <laughs> In, in the United States, anyway, it was 1994 before it was actually legislated that you had to put what's inside the product on the side of the carton. Think about that for a second. Before then, you could put anything. It's the same thing. We learned words like proteins and carbohydrates and fat and sugar content because it was printed there for us. It's the same thing. If we 
can put the carbon footprint on the front of the package and you can see that it's a savings of approximately 80% when you buy an oat milk over traditional cow's milk. It will help people make more responsible decisions. Anyway, all of these things together is what makes us impossible to copy. And I think it's, it's also what gives us one of the best ad agencies in the world, actually. And it is that way because we don't have a marketing department and because we're not actually an ad agency. So before I uh, sign off on this wonderful pre-recorded video, I do want to say one thing. Here's the only strategy document that we have in the company. It just divides things between good companies and evil companies and those that are scared shitless and those that are fucking fearless. And this is how we started when we started Oatly is saying, if we're ever going to make an oat milk company interesting, we have to realize that most people are scared scared to make decisions that are interesting, scared because they don't know what their boss is gonna think. And some of them are good, kind of good, some of them are evil. We need to be completely fearless and we need to be as good as a company, as a company can be, knowing that we're not perfect, but um, our intentions should always be true. And of course, Monsanto, that's no longer a company, was the closest to us, pure, pure evil, pure evil and totally fearless. They would sue anyone. Um, so that's it. I'm going to leave you with this wonderful image of Tony dusting some cobwebs off his atrium windows uh, a couple of years ago. And of course, you can say looking up to the sky um, because the sky's the limit. Thanks, everybody. Hi, John. Thank you very much. Uh, Wonderful presentation. You set a new standard excellent. for pre-recording. <laughs> well, I've never done a pre-recording before, so I figured I might as well like, you know, and it's like you don't have a lot of time to do it to do it. So it's a one take and you just hope it's there. And then uh, anyway, it was fun. It was I fucking fearless. It. You should be proud. <laughs> I, I think sometimes when you're like speaking live, it comes off as like a lot more energetic because it's like you're speaking to a camera alone in a room. I, I hope people enjoyed it. Oh, I think it's very nice. Um, okay, so, I mean, of course, Oatly is a wonderful story. Uh, everyone's very excited to, to hear you talk and hear your take. Uh, whenever you arrive in a country, you know, here in the Netherlands, it was an impact uh, that, you know, people who weren't in the industry noticed. And, I mean, to the, the shift in, in, in Horeca, in, in, in bars and cafes, uh, from what's Oatly to we have Oatly, you know, was incredibly quick. I don't know if that's if it was faster here than other places, but it was amazing to experience. Was it as easy as in other countries? I mean, easy is the wrong word, but was it as quick? Yeah, and I think that that's the most remarkable thing, actually, is that we like imagine this Swedish company going across the Atlantic and we're going to make it big in America. And it's just like how many have tried before? And we went in, in there and we're, we're plant based milks, especially almond, were like even more pre uh, prevalent. And so we walk in and it's like, oh, we've got this oat milk. And everyone was like, oh, thank you very much. But we don't want another one of those plant-based milks that are gonna fuck up our poor. That's basically what the, what the barista said. And so we, our strategy was just be cool, leave it with them, come back and, and see if they liked it. And the product was like world-class, I mean, that's the big secret, <laughs> make it like a world-class product. So yeah. it was so good. It was perfect for the, for the coffee shops. And so for the first time, baristas could pour a milk that wasn't cow's milk that they were actually proud of. And I think that's the real reason it's taken off. The branding and everything, the voice and everything behind it, um, it of course helps and, and helps quite a lot because we're like an irregular company. You know, like we don't fit into the mold of what a what a company should be doing and how they should be talking. And and that just kind of feels real. Absolutely. You, you have had the, these uh, the baristas in your community before they even realized they were in your community. Probably. Probably. That's that's community 2.0. Uh, yeah, but it's just you treat people like people, you know, don't don't walk around like you're a company. I mean, our whole thing at Oatly is. Everyone is, uh, we're a group of people trying to help other people and that's how we should be perceived all the time. If you have an opinion, share it, you know, talk real, uh, help people out. 
prove that you you should be there. Prove that you should exist. Don't try to you know advertise that you're great or something like that. Well, so it's quite quite simple rules, but um, they work. You're certainly unique. Uh, you know, um, I think of a Dutch company, Tony's Chuck Alonely, that I, I would, might put in this category of uh, mission-driven, passionate, high-quality um, uh, international uh, successes. Um, are there other companies that you uh, see yourselves uh, in a similar place of, with? Oh. <laughs> oh wow! I, I know the people at Tony's Chocolate. They're 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 great, and I I think, you know, I really don't. And the thing is, is that I I don't really look at other companies for inspiration. Weirdly enough, definitely not other advertising for for inspiration. I, I'm trying to think of like if you treat a company as something else, you know, like as a mechanism to create like positive societal change, and that is your focus. It's not to necessarily, you know, try to make a lot of money or, you know, increase your sales or anything like that. It's your focus is actually on doing something good and inspiring people to make some changes. And when you do that, a lot of times those sales come. So I, I, I don't know. I'm sure there's a whole new generation of companies out there that are going to be focused on the same thing. Like we need to actually, you know, we have a planet. It would be nice to give it to people who aren't born yet <laughs> and, uh, instead of us being like the last generation to live here. So if we're going to do that, we have to stop, you know, being just capitalistic corporations that are only in it for you know, an exchange, a transaction of goods for service for money. Okay. Uh, let me ask the cynical question too, then. Can senior, you know, you've no worries about ROI, uh, anti-capitalist company wants so much more, but does the senior leadership believe that it, when the cameras are off? Well, I, I mean, we're living in the world that we're living in. Okay, so our our feeling is, is like we're not going to change the world. We can inspire people to change the world. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, Tony is exactly the same. His focus is on creating that positive societal change. But there, we're, we're living in a capitalistic wor world and there's finances and there's all these other things that are a part of what we do. So I think our whole focus has been, um, you know, we're, we're entrepreneurial. We have a skill set that we try to use in a, in, a, um, in a constructive way. Like, what can we do? Well, we can only do these things, you know, build this company and make it interesting and deliver great products that that are that are better for the planet and better for humans. So uh, by identifying so clearly as vegan, was there any uh, worry or pushback from for people who might find that less positive, uh, a less positive term? Um, I don't know. The, the thing is, is that um, we make we make a product that's vegan, but that doesn't mean that everyone who uses it needs to be vegan. But it's pretty front um, and center, you know, on the product. Yeah, it is. But it's like we're we're standing for you know like a a a a change, and people are up to make their own individual decisions. If if I swap out cow's milk every other glass for plant based or oat milk, it's a win. If I do one in ten, it's a win. If I do everything, it's a bigger win. So it's like, I, I can't make up people's minds and, and they've got to like the taste, like what it stands for, and then they make the change. So I, I don't think that, I think if you look back 20 years, um, vegan might've been a term that people were thought were, wow, that's really out there, that's really crazy. I, I think, um, you know, vegan or plant, you know, plant-based, whatever you want to call it is, is, is if it's not mainstream today, it's fast approaching mainstream. It's fast and approaching. That gives us, and that gives us a whole new thing to like, okay, so um, how do we remain relevant? How do we remain, you know, remain the next thing? How, how does this all, you know, it's like, um, so there's a, there's a lot of challenges in that, but, but, but I agree. And it's, it's like, if, if it is moving mainstream and it is moving mainstream, fantastic. I mean, it's it's such a, an achievement for you know both society and the planet. Absolutely. So um, your no nonsense you know style of marketing um, you know obviously it, it goes well with the, the people who to, who drink your milk, uh, the people who uh, are proud to be who associate with your movement. Um, you know what are the lessons from a, such a unique company like yours to other brands that don't have that sort of perfect storm of affinity with their customers? 
Oh, I, I don't know. I've had a, you know, I've had a whole career in, in, in advertising before, you know, Tony, my friend called me up and, and said, do you want to do this? And all the, it's always that, you know, struggle of like, why don't we do things right? And it's, it was always that marketing department that was there who said, no, we're going to do things like we, I need to, you know, I need to do things this way. And they would break everything up. So I, I, I don't know. I just think that people need to have a like more respect for the consumer, more respect for people. Um, don't try to win over every person. Let people make up their own minds. Some people can cannot like your brand, and that's perfectly okay. And just have a like a little bit more humane aspect to what you're doing, and not just think you know success and business all the time. A driving force for us is is failure. You know the right the right to you know. The right to not always be, you know, correct and win all the time. And we, if we can turn that though into something positive, if we can learn from it, then that's a driving force. I, I'm not sure if that answered your uh, question perfectly, but um, I'm sure there was something in there that might yeah. have been interesting. You know, but also, of course, it's nice to be uh, at a company where it is going well that you have the the luxury of saying we don't care if it goes well. Uh, you know what happens if that uh, if those if it goes south? You know, do you have to get more 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 businessy focused or? Well, yeah, that's a question. I hope I never have to answer. I hope neither for it, you. <laughs> we are ve we're very certain. Here's the thing: is it is important that things go right. So don't get me wrong there. I mean, definitely, it's just that we have a culture where failure is not that failure is built in as being something positive because we can learn from that. Uh, and use that to, to 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 move forward. So, I mean, you you, pro you probably can can tell we're, we 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 do like to win and we do like to succeed and we do like to always the next new challenge and and those things. Are, it's just like if someone like the dairy lobby sues us, that's <laughs> where we are our strongest because it's a new brief, and we don't think like oh my god they just sued us. What are we going to do? We think like. Wow, thank you for that brief. Now you've given us something to focus on and we'll give something back that no one's expecting. Um, so those are the things that are kind of built built into the company that the let us be. But we're 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 a we're a science, you know, a science-based this is a scientific food company. It's full of of scientists and engineers. And then we have a voice that's maybe a little bit nonsensical and we have people who can like make this science easy to understand for people so well, that's fantastic and maybe the takeaway lesson is um imagine a company where the creatives were in the center of it and how that takes away a lot of the conflicts that normal companies have maybe with their creatives okay exactly thank I, yeah exactly oh, fantastic cool. uh, thank you very much fantastic uh, uh, presentation and a very exciting company a lot of people are following thanks again yeah thank you